Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Oppenheimer's John Stolfus writing, we expect investors to pay particular attention to the big banks this season for quarterly results and any guidance. That could provide greater clarity into the health of the US economy, what lies ahead and how it might affect stock prices. John joins us now for more. John, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you, sir. Good to kick off the morning with Great you. To be here. How low is the bar? for these banks after the guidance we got in conference season a few weeks back? You know, I think the, the bar is relatively low uh, for, the, for the banks. I think there's an understanding that is beginning to flow through the markets uh, that this is a period of transition. I think the, uh, the numbers that we saw in terms of the economy uh, uh, from the July jobs number and then the most recent jobs number, the disparity betwixt the two, uh, the inputs that are put into the economy, uh, it's it's never very clear there, it, when you're coming into a transition, into a normalization, or whether you're getting into trouble. <laughs> Do you think these bank stocks can perform well with the implied rate path from the Federal Reserve and the SCP I think a month they, or so ago? I think they can. And uh, I, I think that uh, banks today are more efficient than they've ever been before. It doesn't mean that you can't get a disappointing quarter. And I think they, the markets always, when they come in here, very often uh, ahead of the reporting, uh, the markets weaken somewhat. Then if we get some results that are better than expected, who knows what the traders will do? Will they say, oh, it's already done and what, what's going? But generally speaking, you know, the, the, the financials have done very well this year. And uh, a lot of that is the implication that things are getting better even as things remain quite uncertain. To build on what John was getting at, yep. there is a feeling that, yes, it potentially becomes more difficult to make the same kind of net interest income yep. as the Fed cuts rates. Yep. That doesn't seem to concern the markets as much as the ally financial issue. The mm -hmm. potential of credit deterioration among consumers yep. that might be beginning to feel the pinch of some sort of change okay. in cycle. How much do you think that's really the concern that people have that can potentially shake some of the confidence? I think that, that is... Uh, uh, one of the uh, the major concerns, and I, but it's very quite normal that you'll feel that concern at a time when the I mean you consider the Fed is what we had 11 rate hikes, nine uh, nine pauses at the high level before the first cut, and then questions uh, related to inflation being stickier than may have been anticipated before, but likely the hurricanes are likely to to ameliorate that somewhat. Uh, but overall, you know, what, uh, what really has amazed me is, you know, 41 years in this business I've gone through, I remember when Volcker was in his second term is when I came on, is that when you get to this kind of a point, uh, what uh, I've never seen the, the consumers so uh, uh, sophisticated relative to, relative to other periods. And a lot of that could be the dissemination of information uh, the digitalization process of shopping and comparison shopping. Uh, it, I recall a, 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 a prior visit we were speaking about uh, consumer discretionary stocks and how within the retailers you just have to pick the ones that navigate this uh, this current uh, period better than other ones, whether it's uh, whether they have greater buying power than the smaller discount stores or what have you. And the American consumer is remarkably resilient. The jobs number is resilient. Earnings have been resilient. Let's see how this third quarter comes out. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking of uh, someone who we spoke to yesterday from Bank of America who is talking about the resilience of the consumer and how you see ongoing spending in certain discretionary uh, areas. In the past, historically, banks were a leading indicator for the other yep. sectors that might be reporting earnings. Yep. Do you think this time around, if they're better than expected when it comes to consumer performance, they also will be sort of a leading indicator for the rest of consumer discretionary? I, I, I think they should be. It's just that there are so many more inputs today than we've had uh, in, in the past. And a lot of that has to do, again, with that resilience of business. So you, when you, take, you look across the sectors and you see what's working with consumers and 
you look at the uh, uh, the businesses that come in and out of favor quarter to quarter, sometimes day to day with the traders, but there's a general trend that's showing. Uh, there's an amelioration process, a digestion of the interest rates, and there really is a sense that people have more money sloshing around uh, uh, in their savings accounts in different places than uh, many people have anticipated. 5780 at the close yesterday. Oh. Your price target is still 5900. Well, in it's uh, yeah, John, it's still 5900, and will be until the S and P closes at or above it, because we well, that's our that's discipline, that's issue. our self-imposed discipline. So, help me understand where you want to be in the equity market with that in mind. Yeah, with that, we wanted still cyclicals over defensives. It doesn't mean we don't own defensives, but we overweight the cyclicals. Continue to like technology, communication services. Uh, uh, we like consumer discretionary, industrial and financials. Within cyclicals, let's just work through that. Mm -hmm. The financials, where yep. do they fit into this? I, I think the financials fit in because eventually uh, uh, we think that net interest margin is going to work for them. Uh, when, once you get uh, 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 the, there's some volatility in the yield curve that occurs the way things are going in a transitional period. But once we settle to a more normalized uh, uh, yield curve, I think the banks, uh, once the consumer feels more confident, we'll have to see what, what later on today we get the uh, uh, the uh, we, we get the consumer sentiment number that comes out uh, uh, later on today and it'll be interesting to see but the consumer can be it, it, it very emotional on those readings uh, when when uh, the university uh, reviews you know uh, it does its surveys uh, consumers can can be pretty fickle remember they, they, they warmed up for a while the conference board was was negative for a while and they got warmed up a little bit University of Michigan has gone back and forth. Yeah, I love this. If they called me or you, John, they definitely would get emotions. We would sort of express how we feel about sure. inflation going further out. I just want to finish with this idea yep. uh, of whether if rates stay where they are, long-term yep. rates, we're not talking about short-term yep. rates, do you think that it favors one sector over the other? Do you think that it favors the ongoing cyclical kind of rotation that we've been seeing? I think it does favor the, the cyclical rotation, and I think there's a, there's a realization that's beginning to come through is and, but I uh, but it, it it it's still flowing through. Is that we're not going back to see the Fed unless we have a crisis, an unexpected crisis. We're likely not to go back to that band of zero to zero point two five, but more likely in an environment that'll keep the ten-year Treasury at least near term, uh, with all the changes that are happening in terms of the reindustrialization in the United States and in different countries, the process of uh, of diversification of globalization, the expenses related to that. I bet you, you know, in our view, we'd say that the 10 year will probably be in a range in terms of price to yield somewhere between 3.4 to 5 for quite a while. Okay. Somewhere around that right now. John, appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Cross over to Lara Rame of FS Investments. Lara, let's build on the conversation we were just having with Mike McKee and welcome to the program. CPI and jobless claims out yesterday, PPI this morning. I think we're all having some difficulty understanding what to ignore and what to pay attention to. Help us out. I think that's been made even worse by the fact that we got a higher than expected initial claims number, clearly because of the disruption of these natural disasters that are so devastating to small areas of the economy and can have a big impact on the data. I think, you know, it's really the payroll report, the CPI report. Within that, we are seeing just this continued stubbornness in the inflation picture. I think Mike's right. We're on track, certainly for the Fed to continue to ease rates in November, in December. But there's a stubbornness to the services side of this. I think it's one reason why today, too, the PPI numbers maybe didn't make as big of a splash. Goods prices are back in deflation. We know that. The inflation, I think, trouble is really still in the services piece. This, it's maybe trouble's too strong. It's like a mild headache that still isn't going away. Well, Lara, how big a gap is there between the way you see it and the way the Federal Reserve seems to see it? Because we heard from Williams, Goresby, and Barkin, and they seem to cement this idea that for the Federal Reserve, at least, they're comfortable with this disinflationary trend still holding. 
I think maybe I'm a little bit more concerned about inflation, and I'm concerned about it in the short term, simply because I know we are going to have some uh, data disruptions that are going to maybe, you know, create the noise in the food data, create the noise in some of the, you know, prices of, that we're seeing with, with cars. But I'm also concerned about it in the medium term. I'm looking ahead to uh, some of the factors that I think in the middle of next year are going to give us stubbornly higher rent inflation. You know, I don't know how far you want to look out, but when you put it all together for the Fed, they're having to navigate their dual mandate in an active way that they haven't had to in decades. We were either only worried about growth or we were only worried about inflation. Today, we're kind of worried about both the jobs pictures and inflation. And I think it's going to make us all really zero in on data and be more uncertain about the Fed's trajectory. Laura, there was a signal in yesterday's trading action that I thought was really important, which is that the bond market was looking at the prospect of a Fed cutting rates, even with inflation reads that were messy, that did come in hotter than expected, with still some uncertainty about that path of disinflation. Laura, from that perspective, do you think, based on Fed comments, there is sort of a tacit understanding in the market and on the Fed that they will tolerate a higher inflation rate going forward in order to keep any kind of weakness from getting a hold of this labor market? You know, I think they have to because, you know, inflation was so far below target for years leading into the pandemic. I think it's natural, given their average inflation target over time, it gives them the latitude. And I think that's on purpose to, you know, accommodate make policy more accommodative, even if it's a little hot. You know, it's not a bad migraine like 9% inflation back in 2022. It's a chronic headache, but I think it still gives them the room to maneuver. And if they go 100 basis points in total this year, that still leaves rates in restrictive territory. I just think they pause at the beginning of next year and reassess where things are going, because I don't think inflation is going to follow the neat path like it did before the pandemic. When you put this all together, does it make the bond market look more or less Less accurate on the long end in terms of reflecting that there is more flexibility when it comes to inflation rates and the Fed's response mechanism. I, I think it makes the bond market look way more correct for the first time in a long time. The market has been trying to push in too much policy accommodation into the forward curve. They've been making that mistake for two years now. So this isn't new. I think what it changes is that, you know, thinking about Fed rate cuts, we're kind of trained to think, oh, the whole interest rate complex is going to continue to fall. In reality, the tenure falls a lot before the Fed cuts rates, but what it does after the Fed starts cutting rates really depends on the trajectory of the economy. If the economy doesn't go into recession, the tenure kind of floats back up again. I think that's what we're seeing, and it's a reflection of a solid economic base and only an incremental slowdown in growth. Bond yields resume the climb this morning. We're up by 3%, three basis points, just took out 4.1% just moments ago. Lara Rain there of FS Investments. Got Gerard Castley standing by over at RBC. Gerard, let's start with JP Morgan. What's your first take this morning? The first take, John, is that um, the revenues are better than expected, as you pointed out, um, which is which is positive. The provision was a, a, a tad higher, but what's fascinating about the numbers is that the capital levels for JP Morgan are extraordinarily high. They have over a 15% CET1 ratio, common equity tier one ratio. As you guys have been discussing, their return on tangible common equity, very high. So overall, it looks like on the very first quick take, the numbers are slightly better than expected. And again, it will be more on the Q&A period during the earnings call that uh, we'll find out more about that 2025 number. Gerard, can you put this into perspective in terms of what this bank, J.P. Morgan, has done in the past going into periods of potential turmoil or lack of clarity? In other words, is this a provision build something that is normal, something that is analogous to things that we've seen in previous years, or is this unusually large? Um, actually, it was slightly higher than our expectations. We were at 2.9. Uh, it came in to look like at 3.1. And so... It is a very interesting point, though, that you're making, because what we anticipate is credit costs are normalizing. We have to remember that following the pandemic, 
for a couple of years for J.P. Morgan and his peers, the credit costs were extraordinarily low. And when you look at the level of credit costs today relative to other time periods, it, they're very manageable. And, and the important part is, is what you expect for the economy in 2025. And so if you're anticipating a hard landing, then this could be the start of something. But we're in the soft landing camp. The, the, you saw the employment picture numbers a couple of, uh, over a week ago, very strong employment still. So we're in the view that the credit picture for J.P. Morgan and others is, is quite healthy. I do wonder if this is a luxury of being the world's biggest bank or if this is something that we're going to see repeated at other banks. Uh, based on Wells Fargo, we saw actually provisions come in lighter than expected. How much do you attribute this to their not being able to lend maybe on the riskier side or not being able to extend as much the way that J.P. Morgan does? And how much do you think that this just highlights that J.P. Morgan is sort of doing its own thing and sort of preparing for something that maybe other banks aren't seeing? It's, it's interesting because Wells, as you point out, um, they've got the asset cap that's still in place. And it certainly does make it more difficult for them to grow their uh, loan portfolio. And therefore, you could argue that maybe their portfolios could be in better shape. But I'd point out a, a couple of things. First, um, commercial real estate, when you take a look at uh, the deterioration we've seen, it's been very manageable for Wells Fargo. And, and the other important point is that, you know, the banks have been de-risked. Remember, they go through the stress test every year, and the regulators are very tough. So the industry today versus 2006 or, or 1989 or 2000, any of the periods where we went into hard landings, the industry today just doesn't have the risk that it had in those past periods. Now, don't get me wrong, we'll see some credit problems, but they're going to be very manageable this cycle, we think, because we don't see the hard landing over the next 12 months. But all the banks, I think you're going to see, Lisa, we're going to have good credit numbers, even though they're starting to normalize, but overall, we don't see any mass deterioration in credit. It's a big thing to watch this quarter. Jared, appreciate your time as always, sir. Jared Cassidy there of RBC alongside Bloomberg Shinali Basse. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.